So today we're talking about Green Lantern, and before we really get into it, I want to make it very clear, I don't hate Geoff Johns. He's not a bad writer, in fact, he's not even really a bad ideas guy, but he has very specific flaws and drawbacks as a creator that we can't get away from if we're going to talk about Green Lantern. And we're going to try very hard to stay away from the decisions he's made as head of DC Creative, but you can't really talk about modern day Green Lantern without bringing up Geoff Johns. I've heard other people say that Geoff Johns is a creator that has never met a backstory he didn't want to retcon, including his own in his own books, but the real problem is that he's very much a creator who likes to throw everything at the wall and see what sticks. Now that can be a good thing because really you want creators who are willing to create. You want creators who are willing to come up with new ideas and try new things, even if they don't work. The problem with Geoff Johns is that he creates lots of things and then gets bored of them and doesn't really do the, the work required, the backstory filling in part that you need in order for other people to pick up your creations and use them. And that's why, in a lot of ways, most of the things that he's done with the Green Lantern mythos have sort of fallen flat. Yeah, he created a huge new idea of what Green Lanterns are and what they can be, but not a whole lot has come from it because there wasn't a whole lot of focus on making it all work within the universe. Let me try to explain this a bit better. Blackest Night is not a bad event comic. It has the right balance between cool things happening and storytelling that's pushing everything forward. It was not frivolous and unneeded, and all of the various tie-in comics all feel like they give something to the characters that they're about. It's the right sort of mentality, I guess is the word to put it, when you're dealing with event comics. But the flaw in Blackest Night is that it introduced so many ideas and characters that no one else was really prepared to do anything with, which is why, after Brightest Day, they had to reboot the entire continuity. Now, I'm not saying that Brightest Day is the reason why they had to reboot the continuity, but I'm guessing it's a huge part of it, because it introduced an entire new Lantern Corps that was completely erased as soon as they rebooted the continuity. But the real problem with Blackest Night is that in introducing lots of new characters and lots of new ideas, you sort of have to do things with them, and G.F. Johns doesn't have the attention span or the willingness to go back and create context for a lot of his ideas, which is why you end up with a lot of mess and a lot of things that don't make logical sense. Part of that is that he kind of fudges it a little bit when he decided to create all of these things, and we'll get into that. But part of it's also that there's just a poor understanding of the lore itself. Now again, that's not really a problem. I mean, you don't really need to know all of the deep lore for every character in order to write them. You have to really just understand the core of the characters to be able to write in their voice. And he can do that, which is good, but when you're adding new lore, you have to make sure that it at least fits in with the core of the characters. And the problem is that G.F. Johns really doesn't care if it fits or not for most of his characters. When he writes characters, one of the problems is that he's not interested in writing those characters for the most part. He has ideas of what he wants characters to do, and if the characters he has fits that, great. If they don't, he just puts them in anyway, which is why when he's writing characters that he's not really interested in writing, you can always tell, because he just has characters that everyone else doesn't think belong there, but he's just putting them in there anyway. Because for him, he doesn't really care if he's writing that character. He only really cares that he's writing the characters in the story that he wants to tell. And part of this is Demon in a Bottle Syndrome, because he's another writer who really, really, really wants to just reinvent 
every single thing he touches. He's really interested in being the guy who completely reinvented canon for everyone. And usually he has some good ideas, but you can't really do that if you don't do the hard work of filling in the backstory and drawing connections between things. One of the best and worst things about G.F. Johns is that he takes a Silver Age mentality of creating canon, but he applies it in a Bronze Age mentality of what a story should be, and the two concepts don't really mesh at all. Silver Age storytelling is all about going big and going weird and just doing things. There's no real internal logic that applies to a lot of things. The idea is, if this idea is cool and the characters are interesting, the rest sort of falls into place on its own, and that's fine. In fact, I would argue that we need more of that in comics. But the problem is, is that he applies these ideas with a Bronze Age mentality, where everything has to be super dramatic, and you need characters to all be flawed in ways that aren't so much character flaws as they are crippling problems, I guess you could say, where the character flaws are so obtuse and overwhelming that most characters just aren't fun to read. And he applies all of this in an almost daytime soap opera style, where characters just sort of like emote and everything is zoomed in and all of you can just read the pauses in between this like statements that are being made because it's so over dramatic it's almost melodramatic when he writes and so that doesn't really work when you're applying these sort of things to silver age style creativity now i've talked a lot about geoff johns now and again this isn't really supposed to be a i hate geoff johns episode because I don't hate him. In fact, I don't think he's a bad writer. But all of what I've said has to be internalized because the critiques I'm going to be making about Green Lantern are focused almost entirely around this idea of storytelling and this idea of we didn't do the work, we just put in a lot of ideas and now they're all just sort of floating in the ether and nothing meshes. So, for example, the core dynamic between the Green Lantern Corps and their enemies is that the Green Lanterns are essentially space cops, and their rings aren't really mystical, they're technology. They use willpower, which makes some sense. You have people with exemplary characteristics, their ability to overcome fear, and you take those people and you put them into the role of protecting people who can't protect themselves. It's very cut and dry. It's very simple. It's a almost a procedural police drama when you really boil down the stories that you can write with Green Lantern because he's a cop. Like, that's the whole concept. Like, you can do all of the cop cliches with Green Lantern. And so you have the core dynamic between characters that can overcome fear versus characters who cause fear in others. That's the whole genius behind Sinestro versus Hal Jordan and their rivalry. You have somebody who believes that the most important thing is overcoming fear and being better and someone who believes that in order for people to be better, they actually need to be afraid. And this dynamic works perfectly, and it's worked for forever, basically. In fact, that was one of the genius ideas behind turning Hal Jordan evil, is because you can really see how putting people in charge who believe that willpower is the most dominant like characteristic like taking a whole bunch of people who have overwhelming forms of of self-confidence and willpower and putting them in charge can be a disastrous thing like dictators have overwhelming amounts of willpower and are willing to do things because they believe they need to like you could easily turn the concept of people with huge amounts of willpower doing horrible things for the greater good. And that's a story that's been told, and it works. And I bring all this up because 
when G.F. Johns created the ideas of different colors being attached to different lantern cores, he sort of just took the framework of the green lanterns and copy-pasted them, even if they didn't work. So, for example, it kind of works when you're dealing with, say, the Sinestro core, where it's an entire core built up of people who are good at causing fear. But the problem with that, obviously, innately, is that people who are causing fear, much like people who have lots of willpower, don't exactly make for a good core of people working towards a centralized goal. And other writers have sort of dealt with that with the Sinestro core, with things like Mongol trying to take over the core from Sinestro, but I think part of the problem is just that it works there, but you can't apply it to others. So for example, the Red Lantern core doesn't make any sense. Grabbing a bunch of people who are abnormally angry and giving them powers, but reducing them to a bestial state doesn't really work because they don't have any goal. By which I mean, you can't make a core out of them because they're not organized, because rage is not an organizing principle. In fact, one of the most interesting things is when they took the Red Lantern Corps and made a comic book series out of it, they bring this up that the people who are being drafted into the Red Lantern Corps are not organized at all. <laughs> like, there's no guiding principle. There's people who are abnormally angry about righteous things, just as there are people who are abnormally angry about unrighteous things. You can't really create a guiding concept of we're all super angry and make it a centralized organization. It just doesn't work. The same can kind of be said about the Orange Lantern Corps or Larflees, and Larflees is a terrible character just because he's boring and one note and they never really, like even in his own series, they don't really create a complex character with him because he's not meant to be complex because again they're working within the structure of the green lantern core as this is what we copy pasted onto everything else part of this is that they really don't seem to understand how emotions work or what emotions are when you feel them so like willpower is not an emotion willpower is the overcoming of emotion in the context of the Green Lantern Corps. They don't feel will. <laughs> they exert their will over their fear. That's how it works. It's not an emotional core as much as it is overcoming various emotions. And I'm pretty sure the reason it's green is because it's just the middle of the light spectrum, and so it kind of fits into the balance. And you could do something like that where, like, green being in the center is sort of, like, the median or like the most the place where you're most in control versus the further out to red or violet the less in control you are but that's not really how they play it like hope is not an emotion you can feel hopeful but hope is something you have it's kind of like will will is not an emotion you have willpower hope is not an emotion you have hope you feel hopeful but Creating a core around the concept of these people create great hope is super vague and doesn't really work. Now, in the context of the comics, what they usually seem to go with is these are almost Buddhist-esque or, like, Christian saint-esque characters who are all, like, quasi-religious and inspire people that way. And that works, but the problem is, is that, again it's unfocused. You can't take that idea of a core and apply that to people with radically different beliefs on how you inspire hope. And again, inspiring hope is not something they're doing, by which I mean inspiring hope in other people is not their own power. And a person's ability to feel or, I guess, overcome fear through their own willpower works but when you're talking about hope, being able to inspire other people is not your own power. You are not doing your own thing in order to cause other people to feel hopeful. I'm not sure if that makes a whole lot of sense, but that's kind of what I'm trying to get at is it's not the same thing as like fear where you feel it innately or rage that you feel innately or even love that you feel. You don't 
It's not about, like, because the problem is hope is not something they're feeling. It's what they're causing in other people. Now, they kind of do that with the Yellow Lantern Corps and things like, well, they inspire fear in other people, which, true, but the thing that motivates most of them is not just their ability to inspire fear, but their ability to feel fear themselves and understand it. In fact, a lot of these problems go away if you take them and you just sort of go, well, okay, it's not about what they feel, it's about what they do. So, the Green Lantern Corps in that context is, they don't feel willpower, it's about them having willpower. The Yellow Lantern Corps isn't about them feeling fear, it's about them being able to cause fear. The Blue Lantern Corps is not about their ability to feel hopeful, it's about their ability to inspire hope in others. But if that's true, then you kind of throw out the like the whole justification for why they have the rings, because the rings are designed to respond based on their own emotions. So if the whole concept is them inspiring emotions in other people, it doesn't really work if the whole goal is for them to feel these ways. Now, you again, you can make justifications for this and rationalize it. You don't really need to apply a whole lot of deep reasoning, because the audience is willing and able to internalize the concept that these people cause great fear, and therefore they have yellow lantern rings. That's enough. That's really enough as a guiding principle, and part of that's because Sinestro, as the core, as the leader, works for a centralized structure. It gets hazy when you start dealing with, like, the Blue Lanterns or the Red Lanterns, where there's not a whole lot of centralized guiding principle, and so you can't apply the core structure to it. In fact, in some cases, applying the core top-down centralized structure is actually, like, harmful <laughs> to the very ideas and very emotions they're trying to convey. In the cases of the Indigo Lanterns and the Violet Lanterns, or the Indigo Tribe and the Star Sapphires, the way that they've applied the top-down centralized idea comes down to basically mind control. And I'm not sure what that says about people writing comics that they think that compassion and love are essentially brainwashing, but I think that says more about the writers than it does about anyone else who's reading it. Like, the whole concept they've, they've implied with the Indigo tribe is that people join the tribe and then they're brainwashed into having no free will because it's more compassionate if people don't have free will. Which I'm pretty sure is the whole concept behind Sephiroth. <laughs> I'm not sure anyone would look at Sephiroth from Final Fantasy VII and go, yeah, that guy is really compassionate because he's trying to exterminate all life because he thinks that that's better than letting them suffer. That's not compassion. In fact, the whole, whole goal of that story is that what he's doing is not compassionate. It's self-serving and entirely selfish. It's the opposite of compassion. Compassion is not killing people so that they don't have to feel pain anymore. Victor Zatz is not an indigo lantern for this reason. This doesn't work as a concept from a centralized authority. You can't force people to feel compassion. And the same goes for love, where the star sapphires basically kidnap people and then put them into crystals and basically brainwash them, and so they feel love, which again is not love at all. I've never thought I'd had to say this, but the purple man from Marvel is not an inspiration on how you should feel love. That's not love, that's obsession. That's lust, essentially. That's just the idea of possessing people, which is, again, not love, and you can't apply that to a centralized core. Now, don't get me wrong, you could apply a kind of centralized core to the concept of the Star Sapphires. Again, you take people who feel great love and, through their great love, want to do good. You could apply that to a core, and you could easily have them be in conflict with the Green Lanterns. Because again, if you take the Green Lantern Corps, which is based around willpower, which is based around the concept of justice needs to be done, therefore we're going to follow the rules, and you take something like the Star Sapphires, who are based around love, and they say, well, what's just is to have your emotions be a part of it. If we assume that the Green Lantern Corps is overcoming emotion and doing what they believe is right, 
even if their hearts tell them that it's wrong, then you would have the star sapphires be, we believe that our hearts say this is right, even if the rules say it's not. And you could do that, but they don't do that, and so it doesn't work. Because, again, brainwashing is not love, and, again, compassion is not love. You could do a core where they take people in who need compassion, but that's not what they do. They find people who are in need of compassion and then brainwash them into following them around the universe doing something. Again, it doesn't really work because nobody bothered to fill in any of the backstory. Again, G.F. Johns didn't really think too deeply about it, he just sort of put it together. And they've sort of really doubled down on this concept that all the cores are basically the same by applying certain things to all of them. For example, they all have central power batteries, which doesn't make sense. They all have various animals that are embodiment of emotions for some reason. I guess because Parallax existed inside the green power battery, and then they went, well, if Parallax exists, then there should be ones for all of the others. Never mind the fact that none of this makes any sense. Again, applying centralized concepts to very different ideas doesn't work, and it's, again, applying mysticism to things that don't need mysticism. Nobody was sitting around and going, well, how do the, the power batteries actually work? You didn't need to explain that, oh, actually it comes from mystical creatures that live inside of them. Nobody needed that. Nobody was sitting around needing that information. We were already willing to accept that there are space cops with green rings who use willpower to overcome things. They're, we don't need an explanation for all of these things. Part of the problem is that expanding the universe, something G.F. Johns and other writers have continued to do with things like the ultraviolet spectrum of light, which is bizarre and doesn't work either because the X-ray lantern core and stuff just is a stupid idea on its face. Things like that are covering up the rot that's underneath. It's a Going big is an attempt to hide the fact that you've built everything on really, really shaky foundations. Because what you should have done is, if you're going to build the universe, you need to avoid the planet of hats syndrome, where everybody who wears this is just like that, and that's just how they are. It's shorthand and it's lazy, and it really hides a lot of abilities to write good stories because of how limited they've now become in the structures that they've applied to all of these ideas. In essence, because G.F. Johns needed to create a whole lot of stuff really quickly, he fudged a lot of stuff, and because he fudged a lot of stuff, it all comes out sloppy. So, for example, basic ideas that you could apply if you wanted to make more Lantern Cores, or even make the Green Lantern core more unique, or give uniqueness to characters that are meant to be a part of an organization. So obviously they use the idea of everyone has different uniforms. One thing they did with Jessica Cruz is they have that like eye symbol where the symbol itself marks her as being unique. Um, they gave like for a while, Hal Jordan had his own, like, unique look, and Kyle Rayner had his own unique look. And so because everyone looked unique, they sort of gave a personalization to what is really a very unpersonalized organization. But you could take that a step further, say, okay, well, if you have the ability to feel great willpower or great fear or what have you, why not just have them make their own rings? By which I mean, you have the person who is going to be in the core, and you say, your test to be a part of it is to take that emotion that you feel and turn it into a ring. You have to literally forge your own ring, which would create a lot of different designs, but also kind of hammer home why that person is a part of whatever core that they're a part of. It would also fix the problem of emotions and being scattered. So, for example, the ability to inspire hope, you would need characters who have a great desire to inspire hope, not just individuals who inspire hope, but the desire 
for them to inspire hope. So you would take these people like St. Walker, who is so focused on trying to make people understand that everything's going to be okay, and taking those feelings and forging them into something. Take the concept of light constructs and how they form them and apply that to the rings themselves. And so what you end up with is you can now take that that concept of how the cores form, I guess you could say, and you would apply that in unique ways so that every core is different. So for example, the yellow lantern core, which is Sinestro's core, which he puts his own name on it, he made all the rings himself. So the core concept is all the people that he's empowered are terrified of losing their own power. So because Sinestro is the one who gave them the power, they don't want to lose it. They want to keep inspiring fear in other people so that they can keep wielding power. So that auto automatically makes it unique to that core. But what you can also do is you can take this and apply it to a decentralized structure. So for example, the orange lanterns are all super greedy individuals, but also I have a, I'm not sure if they understand the difference between greed and gluttony, or if they're just the same thing in the minds of the people who wrote them, because greed is desire to have things. Gluttony is the desire to consume things. And while they're similar, they're not entirely the same. Even still, that alone could be explored in various concepts of the Orange Lanterns. Have the Orange Lanterns, because they're so greedy, form naturally. And by which I mean, if there's a central power battery, rather than having somebody use it or control it, have Orange Lanterns form due to their own overwhelming greed or overwhelming gluttony, their avarice being their desire for so much to turn them into orange lanterns. And this is kind of done in Larfleeze's own series where we find out that he's been exposed so long to the orange lantern central power battery that he himself is an orange lantern power battery. Like, take that concept and run with it. Like, instead of having just one orange lantern, have orange lanterns become central power batteries on their own and have them be their own like battery have their desire for more be where their power comes from and so you go well okay so wouldn't that cause them to all be in conflict yes and that would be the core of your story because ideas don't just need to be ideas when you're writing you need the ideas to then create new stories so for example orange lanterns forming from people all over the galaxy who are super greedy and all want power would be interesting because they would seek each other out and probably kill each other because they want each other's power. But it would also allow you to create various ideas of what greed and gluttony really are. Like, Larflees and Lex Luthor are completely different individuals. Larflees is vain and has no sense of, sense of like like long-term planning. He just wants whatever's in front of him. Lex Luthor is a character who is always thinking long-term and always trying to acquire more through long-term planning. These are completely different characters, and yet they both can work as Orange Lanterns because they both exhibit things, but they don't work if you're trying to create a central, like, core structure that you do with the Green Lanterns. It just doesn't work. You could take this idea that they form naturally and are naturally in conflict with one another and use that to create new stories. Or, in the sense of the Red Lanterns, for example, a similar thing. Have their rage be what forms their rings, because they're all mad at something. And one of the things, like, you can take story ideas that are already in the canon, for example, Removing a Red Lantern ring kills the wearer. Okay, you can take that idea and say, okay, well, why does it kill the wearer? Because it's formed out of their own rage, and what's powering them is their overwhelming desire for vengeance or for redemption or whatever. In fact, one of the coolest things about the Red Lantern core is that every single character has a unique story. So, like... Bleas, for example, was horribly abused at the hands of the Yellow Lanterns, and she was so angry about it that she became a Red Lantern. 
I forget the guy's name, but it's the goat-headed guy who often ends up as a one-note joke. But his story is interesting because he's so angry at himself for failing. So, like, he's a criminal and he gets caught and they throw him in an oven to burn to death, essentially. And he's so angry that he fucked up. He's so angry that he himself failed when he knows he's better that he gets a red lantern ring that's so more much more interesting than anything they've done with atrocitus like you can have red lanterns who are all super angry and because their power their anger eats them alive inside because it makes their blood literally boil like you could take that and they're super angry until whatever they're angry about is sated so for example you have like i forget the mushroom guy like the mushroom guy lived in like captivity where he was allowed no like in, like he was no contact with anyone else and he was so mad about it and tried to escape and because he was so like when they stopped him and he was so angry about it that he got a ring cool and then you would have a character like that who is that angry go back and try to get revenge on all the people who wronged him. And then when he does, once the, the object of his anger is gone, they die. Like, that would be the concept. They would be like, like a candle that burns twice as bright burns half as long. That's the whole concept, is that the Red Lanterns burn super bright and super hot because they're really angry. And then once whatever they're angry about has been dealt with, they basically self-destruct or die because, you know, that would be, they would have gotten whatever they wanted. They'd have no more source of their anger. And so you'd have individuals like Atrocitus whose anger is impossible, essentially, to deal with because his anger is at both himself and at the Guardians. He's always going to be around because he's so angry at something he can't himself destroy or at least hasn't destroyed yet if that makes sense so because of this you end up with a core that is focused entirely on anger and is focused really in about not being focused like it's a focus on non-focusing you once again have a unified concept applied to a disunified organization and you can apply that again to the other lantern cores you could have you know, the Blue Lanterns, who for some reason have been neutered so that they're only having powers when they're around Green Lanterns for some reason. Again, that's another stupid idea. I don't know why that is. But you could have them being like, they take all their feelings and need and desire to inspire hope and forge that into rings. You could, you know, you could apply that to the, like, the Indigo Tribe as individuals who feel great compassion and want to be compassionate towards others and so they take those feelings and, uh, and create rings out of them. You could have the Star Sapphires, because they feel love towards things, you can have them, like, you can have them take the concept of love and, you know, because they love something so much, they literally draw power from it. And again, because you've now created a personalized nature, because it's no longer the same across the board, you can write new stories. So for example, does it matter what you love if you're a star sapphire? Like, do you love a person, a people, an idea? Like, is, is it possible to be empowered as a star sapphire because you feel such great love for an individual or a species? And is it also possible that you could feel such love for a concept like for example what happens if you have a star sapphire whose greatest love is violence and i don't mean that in the sense of like berserker but i mean someone who genuinely feels nothing but intense passionate love for the concept of fighting the, itself and the more they fight the more love they feel because they're so happy about what they're doing. Like, could you apply that to the concept of the Star Sapphires and have them there be a spectrum within the cores, them different cores themselves? Like, 
is it possible that you could do the compassionate way they're doing with the indigo tribe of the best way to be compassionate is to remove people's pain versus the best way to be compassionate is to help is to help people help themselves you know what i'm saying like you could there are many ways to do and feel these emotions and the ability to decentralize a lot of these ideas would improve the canon immensely now i don't think they're going to do this because geoff johns is in charge of dc and his fingerprints are all over these events where they just keep introducing new concepts and new ideas and have zero idea of where to take any of them like congratulations sinestro is a member of the ultraviolet lantern corps whatever that means and oh there's a there's a first lantern who used all the lights and it's like okay there's an alpha lantern but why 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 are these things why are why are why were these the things you decided to spend your time on because they're not interesting ideas they they they're so short term they're so they're so focused on the demon in a bottle syndrome of we just need ideas that radically change the canon forever whether or not they're good ideas again it's very silver age a I like idea of throwing things out there which is good but it's applied in a Bronze Age context, which is bad, because the Bronze Age was awful for stories and for, like, just characters in general. Everything became super washed out and super one note. Like, all the stories became very, I don't want to say simple, but it essentially boiled things down in such a way that they stopped being complex. And that might take some explanation on why the Bronze Age made things less complex, because that's not the way people see it. Most people see the Bronze Age as being this area where they introduce new ideas and concepts and grittier things. But the problem is, is that taking grittier things is not making them deeper or more mature. Doing Grimdark and doing... Like, everything has to be hyper-realistic, and everyone needs to be a bad person, is not making things more complex. You're just making them simpler in a different way. So, if the Silver Age is simple because it focuses on very black and white, good and evil kind of concepts, the Bronze Age is simple because it turns everything into gray. And all of this matters because... When you apply it to the Lantern cores, when you apply it to that that kind of like thinking that everything's a little gray, to the Lantern cores, which are all designed to be very black and white, it it doesn't work. It doesn't work at all. It it turns everything into very simplistic messes because y black and white thinking can be very complex. Black and white thinking, that sort of good and evil thinking, creates complex characters. I think what's been lost with guys like Geoff Johns and the Green Lantern Corps, the, like, mythos, is that good and evil are, are concepts that seem simple, but which create complex characters. The desire to take what is essentially black and white thinking and apply critical thinking to it creates unique characters. The simplistic part of the Silver Age was not in the morality or the thinking or the ideas. It was how the stories were being told. It was the lack of critical thinking applied by the writers, which hasn't changed. Like, that didn't change in the Bronze Age. There wasn't suddenly an influx of critical thinking from writers. In fact, what ended up happening is most of them just changed the tone and assumed that that equaled maturity and critical thinking, and that's not the case. That's what I mean when I say the Bronze Age mentality. Because what needs to happen is you need to go back to the idea that emotions, especially if you, the whole idea is that you take emotions and you focus them very narrowly, that you take them and you create this idea that there is black and white thinking. 
if you have an entire core that's designed around anger, that's very black and white. If you have an entire core designed around overcoming fear, that's very black and white. So what you do in this case is you apply critical thinking skills when you write the stories. So you go, okay, the, the, the conflict in these stories is good and evil, yes, but it's also about what good and evil means. So, okay, we're overcoming great fear, but does that also mean that we're afraid to trust our own emotions? Are we actually using willpower? Are we actually overcoming things, or are we just trying to hide them and push them away? And you can have these dynamics at play. Or you can just do stories where you have a bunch of space cops fighting aliens. I mean, that's also cool. You don't need it to all be deep. But what you can't do is you can't you can't just introduce lots of new concepts and not really explain them. You have to do the backstory. You have to do the work. And DC isn't doing the work, which is why their Green Lantern properties in the last 10 years have basically been incomprehensible. And now that I've spent a whole lot of time talking about all of this, I hope it's very clear why I think that Green Lantern as a property is kind of crap now. Because so much of Geoff Johns' influences, which already were, it's not entirely his fault because there were already ways of moving things that direction before him, but he basically accelerated it. Like, that sort of way that he does stories and the way he thinks and the way where he goes, well, backstory doesn't really matter. It only matters the idea and how cool it is right now. That sort of thinking is kind of ruining Green Lantern and has basically made everything entirely incomprehensible and it makes it impossible to really invest in and follow for any period of time. And that's basically my thoughts on Green Lantern. Man, this got long.